Welcome to the Mind, Body, and Soul podcast with John Morris. Inspiring, motivating, and educating you in finding balance in the craziness of day-to-day life. Learn from and listen to a man who has a wealth of life experience, from business to bodybuilding, artist to author, and has learned to deal with his own physical and mental wellness. But that's not all. Each week, John interviews and picks the minds of special guests from all around the world and from all walks of life, from actors to authors, wrestlers to warriors, business owners to life coaches, and so much more. Welcome to today's episode of the Mind, Body, and Soul podcast with John Morris. I'm going to divulge my age. I am 44, soon to be 45 years of age. I am a uh, practicing lawyer in the province of Alberta, Canada. Um, I am a mother of two beautiful children. One, uh, my daughter, Abby, is eight, soon to be nine. And my son, Hudson, is six, soon to be seven. And of course, my husband, uh, Dean, uh, who I share my life with and all of our crazy ups and downs and twists and turns. Um, I think generally my understanding of the purpose of our dialogue today is to discuss sort of our family um, dynamic and living with some of the challenges and um, um, exciting moments that involve uh, having a son with autism spectrum disorder, which is um, my son who is uh, again, soon to be seven. Awesome, awesome. And we want to welcome everybody to today's show. That sets the preface for today. Welcome everybody to Mind, Body and Soul, the podcast that helps you find balance in the craziness of day-to-day life. I am, as always, your host, John Morris. And today is a really, really exciting episode because, again, we are talking about autism in the family. Melissa, thank you so much for for coming on today and sharing uh, your story with us and about Hudson as well. For those that don't know, um, and I know everybody's different. I know, you know, everybody will respond differently to autism or, or, you know, dyspraxia or dyslexia or everything like that. For you, explain a little bit about what autism is and how it affects Hudson in particular. Sure. Um, Well, again, as it suggests, autism is a spectrum. And so what that generally means is um, there is multiple different manifestations of autism in children. And so if you were to put, you know, five children with autism spectrum disorder next to each other, each one would have um, very different uh, things that they're good at, uh, different challenges. And so um, it's what makes autism very challenging is that it's hard to describe sort of in a uniform way uh, what autism means. They also still don't have any sense, they being the medical community, what the cause of autism is. And so there's a lot of, uh, you know, theories that are being thrown out some uh, in an attempt for people to find some understanding of this. There has been some very um, significant misinformation about what causes it, as um, I'm sure we'll we'll dive into at some point. Um, you know, generally when you look at a child um, in a photograph with autism, you wouldn't necessarily be able to pinpoint anything physically about the child that uh, suggests that they have autism, like perhaps some, like a child with Down syndrome. Okay. Um, that being said, I can, I can see uh, physical manifestations when I look at my photos with my son because he has a hard time looking people in the eye and looking at a camera. And so you will generally see in photographs with him where he's not engaged with the photo yeah. photographer in the way that the rest of the family is. That being said, it is very quick uh, when you meet uh, Hudson for you to be able to identify that he is autistic. Okay. Um, for him, his level of severity is very high. And again, there are labels around uh, severity and high functioning versus low functioning, which um, doesn't sit well with everybody in the autism community. Uh, For some people, um, and I want to, I mean, I want to respect that because especially for those that are considered quote, high functioning, uh, they don't like that label because they have their own, um, again, challenges that suggest that um, high functioning that they don't have those challenges. 
That being said, it's easier for me to describe Hudson by saying he's severe on the spectrum. Um, it's helpful for his um, treatment practitioners to describe him as severe. And they usually don't just say severe. They talk about different markers of his behavior as being severe. So his ability to communicate, okay. his ability to engage in um, quote unquote normal developmental skills, uh, things like dressing, toilet training, things like that, uh, as well as um, his ability to socialize and engage with the outside world. That is another marker that they yeah. use. So they will use severity language in their letters that they put together, um, primarily to help those that might be stepping in to uh, support Hudson to understand what they're dealing with, but also um, the world of autism is also about setting up families for funding and for treatment and for therapy. Um, and when you use sort of those levels of severity, it usually means that you have an easier time getting um, access to funding for therapy that is needed. So Hudson is, again, severe on the spectrum. Um, he is not able to speak. Okay. Um, so he is what's called nonverbal. Um, we are, you know, we've been, been on this journey for four years now, and most of our journey has been about teaching him uh, communication, and we're making some strides, and, and we can certainly talk about that. Uh, Hudson struggles, uh, he has what's called global developmental delay, and so if you were to place him next to a child in grade one, he doesn't um, necessarily identify colors, letters cannot write his name, do some of those, yeah, yeah. you know, check some of those boxes that children um, typically in grade one would be able to do. Okay. Um, not potty trained, um, not able to dress or eat himself completely by himself. He needs to be assisted by us. Um, does not engage in typical uh, play that a child would. So doesn't um, always interact with his sister or with uh, peers or uh, quite happy just to sort of live in his own world, um, for lack of a better term. Okay, that, that's brilliant. That, that's really, really helpful. Uh, and so eloquently thought there for, for a really in-depth de description on obviously how it affects Hudson. At what point did you know um, that Hudson could have autism? Was it when he was younger or um, I suppose when you were carrying him? Sure. Um, you know, it's funny, people, again, will have very different stories about how their autism journey happened. For us, um, you know, some people will say, I knew, you know, at six months that this baby um, was not engaged, was not, that was not us. Um, Hudson developed, uh, well, he had a, actually a very traumatic delivery and entry into the world, which has always made me query if there is any relationship between traumatic birth and autism, but I don't know that that line has necessarily been drawn by uh, science yet, but otherwise I would say for the first 12 to 14 months, he was developmentally ticking all of the boxes, extremely happy, extremely engaged, uh, learned sort of typical things like um, patty cake, peekaboo, yeah. waving goodbye, blowing kisses, um, walked on time, um, those kinds of things. And then we had, which, you know, a moment which some families will also describe as a light switch moment, where at about 14 months, it seemed as though a light switch went off. Right. And so the developmental progression not only stopped, he had a pretty significant regression in some of the things that he had been able to do. So the patty cakes, the peekaboos all stopped. Right. We started noticing um, some behaviors, um, which we hadn't seen before. Um, things like, and it's a term that the autism community knows well, like stimming. Yes. Um, and so what stimming is, is typically um, a repetitive physical or vocalization that autistic um, individuals use to, to um, handle too much sensory overload, essentially. And so for Hudson, it started out with a clenching in, of his fists repeatedly. And we were noticing that quite profoundly. And then we were noticing that 
he was not playing with toys in a way that you would expect toys to be played with. So instead of taking his cars and, you know, vroom, you know, vroom, 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 yeah. and crashing them into one another, he was lining them up very systematically and very kind of per perfectly. And in his way, sometimes they would almost seem to have a color pattern. Okay. Um, and so that was the, um, for me, the, the sort of moment where I realized that we needed to have someone look into it. Okay. I think my husband was a bit further behind in terms of, you know, thinking in his mind that this might be something that he just yeah. is going through and will get over. Um, but being the lawyer and type A personality that I am, I got the necessary referrals to a pediatrician and then we have a place in Calgary, Alberta called the Child Development Center where they do uh, the actual diagnosis. That all takes time though. Yeah. Um, and I wasn't prepared to wait that long to know if I was on the right track. And yeah. so um, I was lucky that I had the means to hire um, a developmental psychologist and get a private assessment done. And she did not say yes or no. All I wanted from her was for her to look at him and say, yeah, your spidey senses that are tingling yeah. are on the right track, yeah. which is what she did. Yeah, I mean, that, that's really helpful. It's interesting as well that you start out that story by, um, you know, that you had a traumatic birth. And the reason that that really strikes a chord with me is because my wife is a piano teacher, um, currently mm -hmm. somewhere in the house teaching. Um, and she has a, a student as well who had a traumatic birth. There was a lack of oxygen, we suspect, um, when he was being delivered and it's had an effect on him. So it's not uncommon, uh, certainly, to experience things like that. Um, and again, like, like you say, until it's it's confirmed, you've only got you know the things in your mind. But often, things in your mind, you're like, I, I can be fairly certain at least something um, yes. is there. When you started noticing these things, um, and you know Hudson's going through these things, probably has some awareness of you know maybe, maybe what's going on, maybe no awareness at all. Mm -hmm. What was going through your head at this point of my son may have autism or, or there's something not quite right, if that's yeah. correct? <laughs> yeah, no. And I, I have to tell you, between you and I, um, you know, there is no such thing as right or wrong yeah. terminology for me. Um, I find that as well. And we'll, we'll touch on that in, in a moment. You no, know, I know everybody's journey is different yeah. and what everybody is, um, you know, whatever language is important to them is important to them. But for me... I know everybody is generally coming from a place of wanting uh, of empathy and of wanting yeah. to know. And so I don't get too hung up on, you know, what words and, you know, if people want to say my son is disabled, for example, which is not a term that everybody feels comfortable yeah. with. I'm okay with it. Um, there are things that he isn't capable of doing um, that we are trying to teach him to do. And so I think it is from my perspective, an okay word to use yeah. to describe. Um, what was going through my head? Well, I was a very different person. Um, I had stereotypes. I had experiences with autistic children having been at a school okay. um, where there was a class with autistic children down the hall from me in junior high. Uh, that came with some very positive, but also some very negative memories of some interactions that I'd had. Um, I remember um, you know, when you conceive your children, you know, this sort of analysis in your brain, you just want them to have 10 fingers and 10 toes. Yeah. And, um, so for me, my, my initial sort of reaction was one of fear. Um, you know, you know, you start to play out scenarios in your mind of what the future is going to look like for your child, but also for you, yeah, yeah, definitely. because parents don't generally go into it um, saying, I'm going to be a lifelong caregiver. Yeah. I mean, you're obviously a parent forever, but you don't always go into it being a caregiver into yeah. your final years, right? Um, worries around, um, you know, having a quote unquote normal life, things and experiences he may not have as a result, yeah. you know, most of the sort of negative things yeah. come to your head first. Yeah, of course, of course, yeah. Yeah, 
the, the, I suppose, and like you say, you know, it is the natural reaction, you know, for a lot of people. Um, it's funny, I was, again, literally just talking about this before we came on air, that people get an anxious more than anything with what has been or what could be. And trying, especially at that time, you know, when you're seeing your son going through this um, and then trying to stay in the present and trying to focus on, okay, I'm here, I'm now, and try not to get anxious. You know, think realistically, things like that often go out the window. It's, it's unrealistic to, mm -hmm. to expect that. Um, you kind of answered this question, but um, if you can go into it a little bit, um, whether or not it was something that you already knew a whole lot about in terms of uh, autism, or if it was something that you had to do a great deal of research about, um, obviously, as, as, as um, it became more clear and as you grew as a person. Well, I would say I knew nothing okay. um, other than very sort of superficial interactions that I had had with, um, you know, schoolmates that had autism, but I grew up in the generation where those individuals were typically segregated, yeah. um, which, you know, is, is unfortunate. Um, segregation has its place for children. My son is in a segregated environment, but not all no. um, individuals with autism need to be in the yeah. uh, individual environment. Um, so I knew nothing. Okay. okay. Not only did I not know anything about autism itself, uh, certainly in, in Alberta and in Canada, um, and I'm sure that it's the case everywhere, um, the learning curve when it comes to um, the things that you have to do to set your child up for therapy and yeah. Uh, government support, you almost need a degree to figure yeah. it out. And I have said, uh, I've been an advocate in terms of speaking up to the government around some of the issues. I have said, here I am, English is my first language. I have uh, seven years of post-secondary education, uh, one of which is a law degree, and I struggle yeah. to navigate the system. Yeah. And for me, that is wholly unacceptable, especially in a country like Canada, where we are welcoming appropriately of so many people from other places yeah. who um, don't have English as a first language, who don't have the financial um, ability to do some of the things that we have been able to yeah. do. And so um, that that was a whole, uh, you know, undertaking. Um, the learning about autism piece was sort of natural for me because yeah. that just fits into my personality. And it was part of the exercise that I needed to go through to say, yeah, this okay. is, I think this might be what we're dealing yeah. with and let's start the process yeah. for um, getting a diagnosis. Have you ever wanted to learn how to paint but have no idea where to begin? Do you want to learn how to paint for education or simply for fun and to relax? Art can be a great therapy. But there is one problem. Many people want to learn how to paint but have no idea where to begin. With Outreach Art we have all bases covered. We have classes for the youngest, right the way through to the young at heart. From beginners to advanced and even those who wish to explore art therapy. We have something for everyone. All courses and classes are taught by the amazing and internationally renowned John Morris. From learning how to paint landscapes, seascapes and portraits to painting animals of all shapes and sizes. And should you get stuck at any point, our friendly team will be right on hand to help. So what are you waiting for? Explore the options below and choose your own path to creative success. See you in class. That's really helpful and, and again it is interesting I think a lot of people um, e even over here in the UK it is one of the biggest um, grievances the, one of the biggest upsets for many people is the fact that you know governments can be great with looking after refugees and everything like that and, and that's you know that's fine but I think their view is then you know well what about when we need help you know, and, and there's a lot of upset about that, obviously, in Canada as well, um, and, and certainly over here in the UK. Um, it's interesting as well, when you were saying about, um, you know, again, the, the perspective and the fears that were there, um, and talking about, again, having to go through so many hoops. I myself suffer with dyspraxia, um, 
Now, I didn't know that I suffered with dyspraxia until I was 21 years old. And it was only through my uh, college principal that he recognized it. And because of who he was, you know, I ended up getting tested and they were like, right, we confirmed this. But they found a whole, a whole lot of other things that was out there as well. Um, you know, and that's when you're a 21 year old guy and you think if I'd only known this when I was, you know, again, a kid or a teen, yeah, it could have made so much more different and explained so much more, if nothing else. Um, but again, for me, you know, I wouldn't be doing what I am now. Who knows what I'd be doing? Um, and I kind of look at it like this. One of the questions I want to ask you and to get your viewpoint on very specifically, uh, and I have a reason for this question. Did you find when other people found out that Hudson had autism, that they embraced it? Or was it something that they, you know, like, oh, uh, you know, I, I don't know how to deal with that. It's uncomfortable. They didn't know a whole lot about it. Because I know when certain people found out, again, for me with dyspraxia or with colitis or BPD or whatever else that was going on in this crazy artistic mind, you mm -hmm. know, a lot of people responded in a very negative way. What was kind of your experiences with that? I think they fell into three different camps. We okay. had the people who um, were just genuinely interested in helping in whatever way. And they were, they wore their heart on their sleeve saying, I know nothing. I don't know what is even helpful for you, but you tell me and I'm there for you. Absolutely. And I had lots of those people who, you know, rang the doorbell and took off. And when we opened the door, there was a meal sitting there for us. Wow. Um, you know, there are a lot of people who um, don't like it when you get a diagnosis that people will say, I'm sorry. Um, yeah. And I and I understand that. There's He's still my son. There's nothing to be sorry about. But for us, we were in a very dark place when that yeah, diagnosis happened. We had to go through a whole grieving process, which quite frankly still creeps up on us, you know, four, four and a half years later. Um, and so I never felt bad for those people who wore their heart on their sleeves, wanted to help, didn't know how to help, and sometimes just said, I'm sorry, you're going through this. Yeah. Um, that was fine for me, and I loved that. Then there were the people, and it was typically the elderly grandparents yeah. who, you know, he's, he's my, my grandson no matter what kind yeah. of approach, but they just couldn't believe it to be true. Right. You know, it's just a speech delay. It's going to, he's going to quote unquote, snap out of it. Yeah. Um, that was how they processed it. Yeah. And when I had to, you know, make decisions that, or at least plan for that worst case scenario. Yeah. And you always have a plan B if things go better than you expect. You know, they didn't understand why we were planning on this worst yeah. case scenario because he was just going to snap out of it yeah, and be yeah. quote unquote normal again. Um, I would say that was the case for grandparents. Okay. Um, and then there were the people who just didn't know what to say. They didn't know what to do. They didn't know what to say. They had busy lives of, for themselves. That meant that they couldn't invest in the time. Um, and these were, in some cases, very close friends yeah. who just sort of drifted away into the sunset and yeah. who you know, are still in my periphery, um, but not to the extent that they were. Yeah. And and generally it's because it's not always their fault. It's because I can't engage with them in the way that I have been. Yeah. Um, when they talk about trials and tribulations that they're going through, they seem insignificant to me, or they feel bad that they're yeah. insignificant yeah. Yeah. compared to what I'm going yeah. through. Um, I can't just hang out at the park with my son and the kids will play. It just doesn't work that way. And yeah. so some of the things that you would have done with your girlfriends don't happen. And so we, and my husband as well, had some friends that just couldn't understand and didn't know how to help us. And so it was easier for them just to kind of back away yeah. because um, we couldn't have that kind of relationship that we used to have. And, and that's, totally fine too um, as long as you have enough of those other people in the yeah. background supporting you um, but there are lots of parents who are feeling very alone in this process so that's um, and culturally um, some people really bear the brunt because um, you know they're dealing with cultures that just don't understand it or don't um, appreciate the value of a child that may have some differences yeah 
Um, and so for those people, it can be particularly lonely. Mm -hmm. I, I really appreciate that. And, and, you know, just as you're talking as well, it's, it's actually helping explain some things for me as well, because believe it or not, the, the stuff that you're describing there is still things that I go through to this day. Um, and it was one of the questions that I had written down, um, you know, about emotionally how difficult it can be for the people watching on, because I know Katie, Katie's my wife, um, you know, we've been married now nearly six years and, you know, she didn't know when she was marrying me that I had dyspraxia. She didn't know that I would, you know, I was going through post-traumatic stress syndrome as a result of the place that I'd worked, which then led on to BPD. Um, not massively severe, but it's still there. And, you know, I, you have to, you know, kind of come to terms with that yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that there's times that she finds it immensely difficult because she'd love exactly like you described there to go out with her friends or to go out with, you know, have these big family get togethers where you've got 30 people in a room. And to me, that is my idea of an absolute nightmare. There's nothing worse. Um, and and so, you know, I, I can only imagine like you were describing there for, for Hudson and for you, that would be really difficult because again, yes, life may be full of transitions. You know, you, you're not always going to be as close to people as you have been in the past, but it's like you say, it's that mourning period where folks that you've been really close with, then all of a sudden aren't there. And it's like, I feel, you know, quite alone in this. And, uh, and, and, and sometimes it doesn't matter how many people you've got going around you. It's in a lot of ways, it's you and Hudson. How was this journey when, when as, he, as he starts getting older, the realization starts setting in, how was it emotionally for you? Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's funny. Um, I have sort of a number of different emotions that I can have based on what we're going through. Um, we've learned to celebrate um, what people external to us would think of as very small victories, yep. but they're huge for Hudson. Yeah. Um, and so we as a family have learned to really embrace and celebrate all of those things that he is learning to do, yep. um, which may to people outside of us seem very trivial and very insignificant but for us are massive. And so for us, it's critically important yep. to spend time and celebrate those victories. Um, we also have a son who is um, typically with autism, there's, us there's usually a number of secondary yep. tertiary diagnoses that go with it. Uh, global development uh, disorder. Um, for Hudson, it's uh, attention deficit hyperactivity okay. disorder. Um, you would be blown away, John, if you were to see the level of activity he has in a 24-hour period. Um, he stops for whatever little period of time to sleep. Yeah. And that is a little period of time. Wow. Otherwise, is always on his feet running or jumping or just constant movement. So he's like no body fat whatsoever. Um, <laughs> Um, not necessarily what we want him to eat, but yeah. lots and, and just burn it because he's constantly yeah. moving. Um, so we actually, as a family often live in sort of a bit of chaos in the sense that we're usually very tired. Yeah. Um, there are times when Hudson hasn't been in school because of COVID where he was sleeping three, four hours. That was okay. it. Wow. And so that's all we are getting. Yeah. Um, and so to be blunt, um, I've been working on a, a bit of a video for my Hudson, my husband, because we're celebrating our 10th wedding anniversary this weekend. And I'm just looking at myself when we got married and now, and there's been some real significant changes in terms of how the impact has, of this has been on me yeah. in terms of health and wellness, um, and aging and all of those things. And so that's generally where we operate most of the time is in this sort of fuzziness. Yeah. Um, but we also have moments where the grief sort of taps us on the shoulder again. Yeah. Um, and we start to realize things like, you know, we will be his caregiver as long as we are able to handle it. It is very likely he will have to end up in a home because there will be nobody else who can care for him. Or we as, as uh, husband and wife has, have decided that it is not something that we should burden our daughter with, um, that she's entitled to her own life. 
Um, and so that means things like, you know, setting up your estate in such a way that he will be taken care of financially. Yep. Um, but thinking about things like, you know, I always said it's a, a, a parent should never outlive their child, but a parent should also not have to leave their child behind yep. when they have no one to care for them. Yeah. And so that's the scenario that we're in. Um, and so some of that starts to creep up on us and we start to think about quality of life for us as we get yeah. out older and how that's going to look and, um, you know, what kind of behaviors might manifest as Hudson gets older. We are lucky he is, um, you know, some of the very severe cases of, of autism involve things like self-harming. Okay and aggression we are lucky we have neither of those things That's and so but we worry about as he gets bigger that we're not going to be able to handle him as we age um and so those are the that's sort of the yeah. third box of yeah. emotion that we typically find ourselves in huh. um and and actually there's probably a fourth box which is we create um, a very purposeful bubble um which we do for our daughter yeah which usually means having a family member or a respite worker come in and watch Hudson, where we exist as a family of three for a bit. Okay. Um, and it took me a long time to be able to do that without severe guilt. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, but we realized we were better parents and we owed it to our daughter to have moments where we were just a family of three enjoying a week's holiday somewhere tropical because we can't take our son. Yeah. Um, or a weekend away or a trip somewhere for the day. Yeah. Um, and so that's sort of the fourth kind of emotional place that we're in, which is sort of creating an existence away from autism for a period of time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That, I mean, that, that is really helpful. Um, you know, again, and, and there's so much to unpack there. You know, the, the I suppose the, the thing, if I can give anybody any encouragement at all, is yes, to, to celebrate the small victories, whether it's autism, whether it's anxiety, you know, whatever it is, the list goes on. Whatever you're facing right now, it is really important to celebrate the small victories. Um, I've said it to folks before. I mean, for me, I keep lists, and I normally do between three and five things a day. And when I get to the end of it, and sometimes it can be really simple, like get in the gym and have my breakfast. You're building yeah. momentum there. And, you know, and, and people often laugh when I say this. And I'm like, yeah, but with dyspraxia for me, and people don't know this, and I'll share an exclusive. I practice talking every single day um, and doing these interviews just to make sure, because, again, it's very easy for cognitive skills to go backwards. Um, what you were sharing there as well is, I think, a side that people often don't see. Is, is again, and, and I was speaking to someone uh, who has a famous dad the other day, and I won't mention any names, but she was saying as well, you know, that it's it's always her dad that gets talked about, it's never her. And I said, yeah, it's always, that's always the way. People want to talk about, you know, uh, the, the, the person with the issue. They want to talk to the person with the issue and whatever's going on, but they often forget the families and like you say, how it's aged, how it's taken so much of your inner core away, your inner strength. Um, but also, like you say, just it, it, it's it's a lot to, to cope with. And this is your son. And, and, and again, I think it's incredible. I really do, you know, for, for what you do um, and that there are no other words for it. And as a family, you really should be commended for it because, yes, you know, you, your mom and dad and, and sister uh, to Hudson. But at the same point, this is a really big thing in your lives. I have a friend of mine. Um, in fact, he and his wife both have children um, on a variety of spectrums and with a whole load of health issues. And again, he was saying to me, you know, during COVID, it was really difficult because there was no escape. Uh, yeah. You know, normally it was, you know, in school. I want to ask you about that. How has COVID affected you guys? Um, obviously, I suppose in some ways with the disruption that's there aside from the sleep. Um, oh, well, huge. Yeah. Um, so... Obviously, we went into the, a lockdown, as yep. did everybody. I have been working, I work for the university here in a legal capacity. I've been working at home since March. There's no sign that I'll be returning to work. So we were managing um, my daughter's schooling. So I'd be sitting in my meeting with my daughter next to me with schooling. Okay. My husband worked, continued to work outside of the home. He's an accountant. He has a very small firm that he works at with his sister 
literally across the street from our house, very small office, they could manage it safely. Um, and then there was my son who was in um, technically kindergarten, but in Alberta, there are three years of what they call early intervention schooling for kids on the, on the spectrum and with other types of uh, developmental issues. A critical three years. You don't want to miss a single moment of it because that's where most of the funding is directed um, is at that level. And so um, we go into lockdown and you know, the idea of doing any sort of therapy or schooling for him over Zoom or any video platform just went completely yeah. out the door. So with the schooling, uh, they were doing their best to try to, they'd show up at our door every two weeks with a bag full of activities that he might engage in. And that's yeah. always a big might. He doesn't sit down in color. And so it's always a challenge. Um, he lost the regulation associated with getting up, going on the bus, yeah. you know, and that routine. Yeah. Um, but the biggest thing was he stopped getting therapy. Right. So we would typically have um, one of a number of therapists or what we call a, a behavioral aid who works with the therapists to put programming together that would come into our house three days a week. Stopped. Wow. Uh, there was an attempt by the agency to do one day a week of Zoom, or they have their own platform, yeah. didn't work. Um, we expressed concerns to our government caseworker that it just wasn't working, made the decision that it did not make sense for the government to be spending thousands of dollars on this therapy that wasn't working. And so essentially we put our therapy on hold. Okay. So it's a contract and we put it on hold. So he hasn't had anything since March. Um, obviously he's back to school, um, but I've had to undertake my largest advocacy role that I have taken to date when it comes to my son. These agencies are private agencies. When you have a, a child on the spectrum in, in Alberta, you have the option to hire uh, an agency that puts its team of therapists together and they bill the government and the government pays, pays them. Or you can go and hire all the therapists you need privately and assemble your own right. care. Team. Very challenging to do. Also expensive because typically what an individual speech pathologist would charge is well in excess of what the government hourly rate of funding is. And so the people who do that often end up out of pocket as yeah. well. So most people go through this agency model. The agencies have decided that they will not return to in-person therapy right. because of COVID. Uh -huh. In Alberta, we have made the decision that it was safe to return to school. It was safe to return to, so physiotherapists can now open their doors, chiropractors, yeah. dentists, doctors, all of this stuff but we are unable to get therapy for our son right. in person, which to me was incongruent. And so um, I have been writing to our ministers and to whoever might listen to me. And I even got as desperate as to reach out to the media yeah. about government intervening in. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Kids are getting left behind. They need their therapy. Yeah. This is critical. I don't consider this to be any different than you know, somebody going in and getting dialysis, yeah, for example, yeah. this is extraordinarily important. Um, and so I've actually been more recently um, dealing with our, would be the provincial equivalent of the, a member of parliament. So we call them MLAs, yeah. member of legislative assembly. So it's the provincial level um, who mandates all of this therapy. Uh, I have him on my side. So he's writing a letter to the minister of support saying mm -hmm. it needs to be addressed. But that's been the largest thing is that my son who cannot speak has not seen a speech pathologist since March, if you can imagine. Wow. wow. Um, and so, or has not seen an occupational therapist or a behavioral therapist or anything like that since uh, lockdown. It, it, it's one of the things that is really difficult for, for a lot of people to comprehend that, you know, all of these organizations and charities that exist, whether or not it be 
de uh, dementia Scotland, whether it be cancer research, all these different things, and like you said, with, with um, speech therapy and, and all this stuff, how vital they actually are to, to people, you know, and to, to their everyday lives. And, you know, I, I get right now we're living in very, very crazy times. You know, we're living in really a lot of unknowns. But mm -hmm. again, you know, it, it's... It, it's almost unbelievable that there isn't something there that, that can be done um, to, to help more than, than obviously, you know, than, than what there is. How have you noticed Hudson's um, autism, I, I suppose, how have you noticed Hudson's condition changed from when he was younger to where he is now? Oh, how is, have we noticed? Um, I think it's just fair to say that those sort of developmental gaps just got larger okay. and um you know that's you know in spite of all of the therapy and uh, early intervention programming he's still making strides yeah, yeah. but the gaps it, maybe the gaps would have been even wider uh -huh. uh, without those um you know i never thought that i would have an almost seven year old who is still yeah. in diapers mm -hmm. um you know, he still needs our assistance to be to feed. Okay. Um, he does not understand the concept of danger. And so he needs constant, almost like a yeah. toddler supervision. And so, you know, the gaps just get, some of the things are the same, yeah. but the gaps just seem more profound because, yeah. um, you know, when he was three and he had to be supervised, it's different than when he's almost yeah. seven. Yes. Yeah. Supervised, and I, yeah. you know, I hate, can't help but compare his sort of developmental trajectory to that of our daughter, who, you know, by four was largely able to be independent and play and could go into her room, and we didn't need to, you know, watch her every move. Um, not the same, and so, you know, the the degree of uh, need that he has is. Um, so high that my husband and I live largely yeah. what we call a divide and conquer kind of uh -huh. life, which is, you know, one kid goes with one and the other kid goes with the other. And rarely are we able to kind of meet in the middle. And it sort of reminds me, there is a, um, a blogger in the UK who I follow and I'm going to, there's so many of them. So I'm going to yeah, yeah. get the, the blog wrong, but it may ring a bell and you can look into him after, but I find him so inspiring. So he has two children on the spectrum right. in the UK, two boys. Um, and he is no longer married to his wife because the reality is, is that kind of life is very, very taxing on yeah. the marriage. Yeah. And the children are not capable of being together. And so they live this life of constant back and forth shuffling of these kids right. because they aren't, they can't be together without creating anxiety for each other, the kids. And so he doesn't get reprieve. His wife doesn't get reprieve and they live this sort of very chaotic life. And I just have so much respect for him yeah. um, because in spite of that, he's just got this lovely approach to life um, in spite of some very difficult things that he's going through. And, um, and that's, you know, that's sort of the way it is. Yeah. Um, you know, you just start to notice that gap widening and you just try to kind of recalibrate and figure out how to address it. Um, and we have moments where some of those gaps narrow mm -hmm. and we see some progress, but then they kind of go back right. to, and that's just the unfortunate reality. We had moments mm -hmm. where we thought potty training, for example, might be in the future. And yeah. then we had a shift. And so it's just sort of a constant recalibration and um, rejigging of goals Oops. and, um, you know, a real um, effort to say, okay, what is actually realistic yeah. at this point? Definitely. Uh, and it's not a failure. It's not, um, you know, it's not us giving up nope. if we park something for a while because yeah, yeah. it's just not the most important or it's just not a good use of our resources at the time. Yeah. Um, and so that's just how we approach life. It's definitely one of the crazy things that we can make the, all the plans that we want, but sometimes, you know, things can just come along, you know, and uh, and, and just knock us way off course. Um, 
You've got a, a Facebook page, which I proudly follow, and um, I want to encourage folks to check it out as well. It's called Hudson's Journey, and it gives a real in-depth, I was looking at it again last night, um, just again, just as I'm, as I'm thinking about questions, um, it gives a real in-depth look into what Hudson is facing, obviously what Melissa is talking about here. Melissa, I want to ask you, um, I suppose with this journey that you're on, what have been some of the hardest things and, and I suppose the, the greatest times of difficulty that you've had to go through um, on, a, on a personal level as well, um, obviously with, with Hudson's uh, journey? Um, I mean, the single most difficult day was the day where we got the diagnosis. Okay. I mean, we, it's funny, you just know it's coming. Yeah. But there isn't any amount of preparation that you can ever do mentally to yeah. until you hear those words. And then there were aspects of that diagnosis that made it even more challenging in the sense that normally it's a, you know, two staged uh, process. It was so incredibly obvious that they didn't even bother with the second phase. Right. And so things like that kind of weigh on your yeah. the little markers sort of weigh on you and you go, wow, it was just that obvious. What does that mean? Um, obviously very difficult. Um, grade one this year was very difficult. Um, it meant he was going from half days at school to full days at school. Okay. It meant graduating out of the earlier in intervention system in Alberta and moving to quote unquote regular school. Okay. Um, we found that to be a very challenging time because, uh, to be completely blunt, the resourcing in our school system is not yeah. what it should be. And I think that's probably universal in nature. Um, and so finding our way in that system, um, has been tough. And we in, in Alberta operate on, um, we have an unusual system we have choice in education well what does that mean well there's a regular non-religious board mm -hmm. there is the catholic run school board there are what they call charter schools which are you know various mandates that they operate under and then there are private schools okay. and so people say well where are you going to put your son and it was like you just have no sense of what's yeah. in your best yeah. interest um, his early intervention system would not tell us where to put him. Right. Um, they didn't feel comfortable doing it, but then kind of on the down low, they would kind of make their yeah. recommendations yeah. and whisper. We were told, um, that at least in Calgary, that the Catholic board was better set up for children with Hudson severity. So that's what we did. We're not Catholic. We're, uh, Greek Orthodox, mm -hmm. but, um, treat, they treat us the same yeah. in that system. So we were able to get in with no problem. He is in a class of six kids. That was another really tough yeah. pill to swallow when you realize that your child is in the highest needs class in the entire school system. Um, sort of puts things kind of right out there for you, right? There's no getting around it. Uh, we always have very somber moments in our house when we receive uh, reports from the school system um, usually again, identifies in bold colors, uh, where those gaps are and how profound those gaps are. Um, so those are tough moments for us. Um, we have, I, I would say COVID has been one of the toughest yeah. things that we've had to go through as a family. Um, just husband and I just on fumes, yeah. you know, not able to ever really enjoy ourselves as a couple. Um, and we weren't able to get respite into the home until, gosh, probably not until July. So we had months without any help. We were trying to be careful with family as well because some of them are older. That being said, um, my husband's mother has been our godsend in terms of helping us from a childcare perspective. So she takes my son once a week. Mm -hmm overnight so that we can catch up on our sleep yeah. and enjoy whatever we might be able to yeah. do with them. Do you struggle with motivation? Feel yourself procrastinating a lot? 
have amazing ideas and dreams but struggle with the concept of how to get from where you are to where you want to be. Or maybe looking for something a little bit simpler like wanting to get fit or maybe wanting to lose a few pounds and tighten things up. Are you someone that struggles with anxiety or trauma or even depression? You're not alone. Many people around the world do. Hi folks, I'm John Morris. And for the last two decades, I've been working with people from all over the world in all walks of life to really understand human beings, the concept, the behaviors, and ultimately the reasons why. And I've had the privilege of coaching and working with folks just like you, that maybe are struggling with anxiety or depression or trauma or wanting to get ahead, wanting to maybe build some long-term success, but have no idea how to begin. This is what I do. And with John Morris Life Coaching, you're in really, really good hands. Why can I say this? Because you're not only gonna get an experienced life coach, you're also gonna get somebody that has a wide variety of experiences, from youth ministry and working with teenagers and children, to someone who's worked with drug addicts and alcoholics, people that have day-to-day -day dependency issues, to, to somebody maybe just like you, that just wants that little bit of encouragement, wants that little bit of motivation, and wants support to get to that next level. With John Morris Personal Life Coaching, you're in really good hands. A lot of my clients would tell you, if they were here now, that one of the greatest assets to John Morris Life Coaching is you can see things exactly as you want to see them, without fear of being controlled and conformed like a lot of therapists and coaches do. We help you right where you're at to get to the place that you want to be, step by step, to figure out a plan. So if this sounds like something that you would be interested in, having that support, motivation, encouragement, and even education, should you need it, then get in touch with me today. I would love to hear from you. Places are limited, so please don't delay. We've got a very, very small window of opportunity remaining. We all need help from time to time, but the difference between success and failure, achieving our dreams, and maybe just letting our dreams go by, depends on the level of help that we have available and that we're willing to accept. So get in touch with me today at John Morris Life Coaching. You'll be glad you did, and I'll see you soon. It, it's definitely rough, uh, and, and, and I, I just can't imagine, you know, what you're going through. Uh, I know in, in my own self, as I said earlier on, that, you know, and, and I think for many, when they've got a condition, whatever it is, um, you can never really plan things. And I, I would imagine it's even worse with kids because you never really plan things because you never know what's going to happen the next day or even in the next five minutes. You know, um, some minutes they can be fine. Some minutes, you know, the, you know, all hell can break loose. And, I, and I've seen it happen before in the art school. And, um, you know, it, it's a very, very, it's a very difficult thing to, to cope with, um, mm. you know, and, and I don't think there's any other way to, to really present that. Um, and like you say, you know, I mean, it's it's very taxing on the marriage as well. Um, and especially, like I say, when things just come out of the blue that you don't expect to happen. But the, the important thing that I want you to know is that you're not alone in this. And there's so many people, as I'm sure you're aware of, um, you know, that, that have already, you know, that are going through very similar things. And if, if doing these interviews has taught me anything at all, it's how many people seem to be going through or know somebody that's going through the same thing, um, you know, and, and that's in some ways a, a sense of comfort and a sense of sadness as well that so many people are going through this. Melissa, I want to ask you a couple of final questions. Um, if, if somebody is either suffering with autism or they know somebody that's suffering with autism, do you know where you could direct them to maybe get more help or to find out more about autism? Yeah, I mean, I, I do really want to discourage a lot of what I did, quite frankly, which was the doctor Googling stuff, because that I think can get you down the wrong path. Yes. <laughs> um, you know, where I, I still get most of my comfort is in groups that have been uh, established of parents who are going through similar situations. Yeah. I would almost guarantee that every uh, country, every province, every city has um, an autism parents group on Facebook. So I'm a member of a Calgary moms group. Uh, the unfortunate reality is there are less of those groups for dads. Um, yeah. Dads just handle things I think a little bit differently. Um, in Calgary, we have uh, Autism Calgary, Children's Link, organizations like that that help the parents with that navigation piece that I was talking about. And so I would assume that in other parts of the world that those types of organizations are there. Um, then once you become a seasoned veteran, which I suppose I am now, 
Um, I do absolutely everything that I can to educate and to help people who are going through that journey. And so um, I, I do reach out or, or have people reach out to me and say, can, can I uh, introduce so-and-so to you? They're just starting in the journey and I jump at the opportunity because I remember what that was like. Yeah, that is really, really yeah. fantastic. Just before we wrap up today, is there anything that you would like to, to discuss that we haven't talked about? Yeah, I think I want to lead, I don't want to leave um, the listeners with the impression that everything is, no. you know, hard and difficult and we struggle, you know, we have those trials and tribulations, but um, we have been blessed with a little boy who um, is so loving. He is, uh, likes to be hugged, likes to be touched, all of those things that sometimes isn't present yeah. in autism, um, you know, just loves to if he if he's decided you're his person and it can happen very quickly um he engages with you very quickly yeah. he is generally very laid back we don't deal with a lot of meltdowns which is really lucky um so generally he's actually a really laid back chill easygoing boy um who's just really really fun and who has allowed me to grow significantly as a That's person brilliant. Talking yeah. about actually, just before we wrap up, in what ways have you seen yourself grow um, as, as a person as, as uh, obviously this journey has progressed? Um, well, it's opened my eyes up to, um, you know, just the world of, of autism yeah. and, you know, what families and children need who might be going through this journey that I may not have been um, aware of when I um, didn't live in this world. Um, it has allowed me to have empathy that I don't think I always had. I mean, I had some degree of it, but not, it just sort of expanded. Um, my patience has grown thousands of fold. <laughs> um, and the one thing that I really love is my daughter has just turned into the most amazing person because she's become such a, an advocate and caregiver for her brother that I think that she has grown as a person because of uh, having her brother in her life. That's really brilliant. And, it, and it's, it's amazing, you know, that no matter how many difficult situations we go through, there is always something when we reach the other side that we can grow and develop from. Um, and it's been absolutely awesome to chat. I definitely encourage you folks to check out um, Melissa's page of Hudson's Journey so you can see yourself. Reach out to Melissa. Um, again, you can do that through that page as well. And if you would like to, uh, you can always get in touch with us and we can direct you on to, to Melissa as well. Um, and if you're interested and you're struggling yourself, again, don't feel that you're alone. Please do get in touch. This will be on YouTube so you can get in touch with us on the YouTube page. Don't forget to subscribe and tell a friend. It could be the thing that saves them from insanity. Um, and also on Facebook as well. If you're interested in reading and getting help, you can come and visit us at thebattlesweallface.com. You can check out my brand new book, The Battles We All Face. And uh, also you can check out some artwork at johnmorrisartfromtheheart.com. Melissa, I want to thank you so much for being our guest today. We really, really appreciate it. I'm sure we'll discuss more again in the future because there's so much more to unpack and it's been an sure. absolute pleasure. Folks, thank you so much for watching. Take care, God bless. We are out of time and I'll see you next time. Thanks, John. Bye-bye.